Next, we'll discuss hypothalamic pituitary hormone regulation. You may remember that we already covered this earlier in the embryology section, so this will be a good review for you. In general, the hypothalamus releases hormones that stimulate the anterior pituitary gland to release its own hormones. Luckily, a lot of these names of these hormones give you a clue as to what they do. We will start off with the hormones that are stimulating the release of other hormones. First, we have thyroid releasing hormone, TRH. That, yes, you guessed it, causes the release of thyroid stimulating hormone. Again, from what part of the pituitary? Right, the anterior pituitary. TRH also stimulates the release of what other hormone? Prolactin. So what might be a complaint of a person who is producing too much TSH? Galactorrhea. Corticotropin releasing hormone, or CRH, stimulates the synthesis of proopiomelanocortin, or POMC, which is much easier to remember, which is a peptide that is then cleaved into three important molecules. Do you know what they are? They are melanocyte stimulating hormone, ACTH, and beta endorphin. There is an important clinical correlate that I will test you on later on in the pathology section, so don't forget this. Moving on, growth hormone releasing hormone, or GHRH, stimulates the release of growth hormone, or GH, and gonadotropin releasing hormone. GNRH, in turn, stimulates the release of follicle stimulating hormone, or FSH, and luteinizing hormone, or LH, which act on the gonads. A key thing to keep in mind is that the boards love to test you on exceptions to the rule. So, a perfect example of this is the one pituitary hormone release that is based on negative inhibition. Thus far, all the hormones we have discussed have been stimulated by the presence of another hormone. Do you know what hormone is regulated by negative inhibition? You got it. Prolactin. And what is it inhibited by? Dopamine. I will talk a little bit about prolactin later on, so stay tuned. Now, do you know what hormone prolactin inhibits the secretion of? Good. GnRH. And we'll discuss this effect in more detail a bit later. Although not related to the hypothalamus, somatostatin blocks the release of GH and TSH from the anterior pituitary. Do you remember where somatostatin is produced? Right. It comes from the delta cells in the pancreas and the small intestine. As you may remember, prolactin is produced by the anterior pituitary and stimulates milk production. There are two molecules that can affect the release of this hormone. Dopamine, which is constantly produced and will inhibit the release of prolactin, and TRH, which stimulates its release. Usually, TRH levels are not sufficiently high enough to overcome the inhibitory effect of dopamine. What do you think would be the underlying cause of an elevated prolactin level? hyperthyroidism or hypothyroidism? Got the answer? You'd be right if you were thinking hypothyroidism. If you want, pause the video and take a moment to think about this. The reason is that in hypothyroidism, TRH levels increase, which cause prolactin release. Now, why does a patient who is hypothyroid have high TRH levels? Well, when you are hypothyroid, you are not making very much T3 or T4, so you have decreased, and as a result, there is no longer negative feedback from these hormones to block the release of TRH. So you have high TRH. See how this all ties together? If not, please take the time to pause the video and look through this problem again. If you are still having trouble, don't worry. We will review thyroid hormones later on in this lecture. Going back to prolactin, the function of this hormone is very interesting. As I mentioned, it stimulates milk production. And do you remember how prolactin can affect the release of another hormone? Great! You remember that it also blocks the release of GnRH, or gonadotropin releasing hormone. And why is that important? Without GnRH, you don't have the release of FSH or LH, which means that ovulation does not occur. 
Now why might this be important in a woman who has just given birth and is breastfeeding? Evolutionarily, a baby born to a woman who can devote all her energy to caring for this one baby will probably survive a lot longer and be a lot stronger than a baby whose mother is caring for another child as well. However, please remember that for your patient's sake it is not a very reliable form of birth control, and some women can still get pregnant during lactation. Another interesting fact about prolactin is that once secreted, it stimulates dopamine production, which then inhibits prolactin secretion, thereby maintaining homeostasis. There are some drugs that interact with prolactin that you should be familiar with. One is bromocryptine, a dopamine agonist. So what do you think it would do to prolactin release? Well, it will inhibit it. And this drug can be used for the treatment of prolactinoma, which is the most common type of functional pituitary tumor. On the other hand, dopamine antagonists, such as most antipsychotics like haloperidol and fluvenazine, as well as estrogen-containing oral contraceptive pills will stimulate prolactin release. So what might be a side effect of these medications? Well, just like we talked about before, galactorrhea. Growth hormone, also known as GH or somatotropin, is released in a pulsatile fashion by the anterior pituitary in response to growth hormone releasing hormone. This is an important aspect to consider as secretion levels will vary throughout the day. For example, secretion is higher during exercise and sleep and is inhibited by glucose and somatostatin. There are a few major functions of growth hormone that are important for you to know and you can group them into catabolic and anabolic effects. Catabolic, as you know, means breakdown and is a process by which our body mobilizes molecules that can be used for energy. Growth hormone has catabolic effects by decreasing glucose uptake in fat and muscle and increasing activity of hormone-sensitive lipase to mobilize fat stores. In terms of its anabolic or building effects, growth hormone promotes gaining of muscle mass. It sometimes is abused by athletes or by bodybuilders for that reason. The way it increases muscle mass is it increases amino acid uptake into cells. Additionally, it will stimulate linear bone growth, which I will talk more about later on. Many of the effects of growth hormone are actually mediated by another molecule called IGF-1, or somatomedin. IGF-1 is short for insulin-like growth factor 1. Remember, the boards may use these names interchangeably, so be sure not to forget them. When growth hormone is released, it stimulates production of IGF-1 in the liver. And as I mentioned earlier, IGF-1 promotes linear bone growth by stimulating cartilage proliferation in bone cells. Also, recall that growth hormone is produced in pulses so it may be difficult to measure and to get an accurate sense of whether or not someone is producing enough growth hormone. IGF-1, however, has a long half-life and can be measured at any time of the day to assess growth hormone levels. In fact, this is the screening test of choice, as we will discuss later, for growth hormone deficiency. Growth hormone is also said to be diabetogenic. Now what does that mean? Well, one effect of growth hormone is that it decreases glucose uptake. And if that is the case, what will happen to blood glucose levels? Right, they will be elevated. And chronic elevation in blood glucose stimulates the release of what hormone? You guessed it, insulin. And over time, your body can develop insulin resistance as it's become accustomed to these very high levels of insulin and no longer will respond appropriately. This in turn may result in type 2 diabetes or could lead to metabolic syndrome. These will be discussed later in the endocrine pathology section. An important clinical correlate related to growth hormone are pituitary adenomas that secrete excess amounts of growth hormone. 
Do you know how this differs in children versus adults? In children, this results in gigantism because the growth plates in these children have not yet fused and all the bones grow proportionally large. In adults, however, their growth plates have already fused and they will develop acromegaly in which you see disproportionate growth of the face and enlargement of the hands. We will talk more about this in the endocrine pathology section. Antidiuretic hormone, or ADH, has already been discussed in our anatomy section, so this is a great opportunity to review what you have already learned. Do you remember where it is produced? Great, the hypothalamus. Specifically, the supraoptic nuclei make ADH, and it's released by the posterior pituitary gland. So what does it do? Well, remember it depends on what ADH receptors it binds to. Remember that ADH also goes by the name vasopressin, or arginine vasopressin for that matter, and therefore the names of the receptors are V1 and V2. The V1 receptors are found on blood vessels, and do you know what happens when ADH binds to them? Right, it causes constriction which leads to increased blood pressure. Now what about the V2 receptors? These are found in the collecting ducts of the kidney and it is where ADH stimulates insertion of aquaporin channels allowing for the resorption of water. What is the net effect of water resorption on serum osmolality? Correct, it decreases it. And what happens to urine osmolality? Right, it increases it. So, how does your body know when to release ADH? Well, the primary stimulus is when the osmoreceptors in the hypothalamus sense increases in serum osmolarity. As you may recall, this is an area of the brain where there is no blood-brain barrier. The second driving force for ADH release is hypovolemia.